Hello, everyone, and welcome to Localhost. My name is Rachel, and I'm the Director of Operations at the Recurse Center. Localhost is a series of monthly technical talks from members of the RC community, open to recursers and the general public. As always, we're excited to see so many new and familiar faces tonight. If you're not familiar with us, the Recurse Center is a community-driven educational retreat for programmers. We're currently based in Soho, and people come from across the country and around the world to spend one, six, or 12 weeks becoming better programmers together in a self-directed and highly collaborative environment. At RC, you have the opportunity to direct yourself, to pick projects that you find intrinsically motivating, and to spend your time learning the things you always wished you could. People come to RC from a wide range of backgrounds and skill levels and use their time to learn and work on almost any kind of programming project you can think of, from apps to games to compilers to art to original research to wonderful hardware projects. Uh, we're completely free to attend, and we run an integrated recruiting agency to help anyone in our community interested in considering new jobs at wonderful companies like Etsy. If you enjoyed tonight's talk, please consider applying to RC. There's still time to apply to our summer batches. A quick note about how this talk will run. Sam is going to talk for about 30 minutes, uh, after which we'll have a two-minute break. During that break, you're welcome to leave or to stretch a bit. And then after the break, we'll have a dedicated Q&A session. Please do not ask questions during the talk. There's a few reasons that we have a separate Q&A session. Taking questions during the talk is disruptive, and having a break in between the talk and the Q&A keeps the talk time boxed and allows folks to leave if they wish. We also find that having dedicated time for questions leads to more equal audience participation and better discussions. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker, Samantha Goldstein. Sam is a software engineer on the activation team here at Etsy and an RC alumna. If you do not have the good fortune of knowing her from real life or from her Twitter feed, she's also the inventor of some really incredible hardware projects, including YubiKey earrings, a stained glass weather unit, and an RFID powered secret shelf, all of which she'll be discussing tonight. Uh, I truly cannot stand the wait any longer, so <laughs> please join me in welcoming Sam. <laughs> Um, hi, hello, I'm Sam. It's so nice to see you all. Um, I'm a software engineer here at Etsy, and also I went to RC. Um, and I really love to make things with my hands and come sort of precariously closer and closer to electrocuting myself, which I haven't done yet, thank you. Um, I'm gonna be speaking to you about crafting a connected home, but I'm actually gonna be speaking to you um, about how to recreate my very specific childhood fantasy of being a spy. <clears throat> so uh, please step into my 90s fever dream, if you will. Um, just like a little bit of background. I had this like little journal that you would like whisper a password into and it would like open. I could never remember the password, so I would have to reboot every time. Um, I tried to make a sort of hidden compartment uh, behind my closet so that I could you know, hide contraband from my mom. Um, I also tried to start a secret society in the woods, um, <laughs> which was perhaps my greatest failure, but I think there's still time. So, um, what all these projects have in common is a hidden mechanism or a hidden depth and secret meaning that's only um, accessible for a select few um, who have like a secret key. Um, and though my secret society was a bust, I have been building a small collection of gadgets that might have impressed a 10-year-old me. And hopefully after this talk, you can also make my dreams reality. <laughs> I'll show you how to uh, make a ring that can unlock drawers, cabinets, homes, or um, offices like this one right here. Um, and then I'll show you how to connect a piece of stained glass to the cloud. Totally spy related, I swear. <laughs> um, so the first thing I did for this talk was uh, Google how to be a spy. And WikiHow has really good SEO, so here's how to be a spy. Um, so we're gonna see if I can sort of hit some of these notes laid out by WikiHow. Um, and I need you to know that these are real images from WikiHow, like, I didn't make this up. Um, number one, going unnoticed. Hide in plain sight. Okay, so here's something that I made um, that I think qualifies as hiding in plain sight. Uh, I wanted a ring that would sort of like unlock a hidden door in my apartment, 
Um, but I did sort of the New York real estate equivalent and made a ring that unlocked the shelf. So there you go. Um, so how does it work? It uses um, an RFID chip, which is the same thing that's in a lot of like contactless payment systems, um, or more closely like a badge that you'd use to get into a building like this one. Um, RFID stands for radio frequency uh, identification, and it uses an electromagnetic field to read a small piece of data, um, like a unique identifier, uh, stored on a chip. When the reader receives um, a permitted key code, it can then trigger an event like open a secret door or explode a die pack in a bank heist, which we will get to. <laughs> um, so there are a couple types of RFIDs. There's active and passive. Um, a passive tag is powered externally. Um, it works at really close ranges because it doesn't have its own power. And um, it's used for something like contactless payment, badges, package tracking. Um, and an active tag has its own power source. And because it itself has a power source, it can go a much larger range. So something like EasyPass um, uses active uh, RFIDs. So that's great. Um, I'm not going to be talking too much about those uh, because you can imagine having an active tag uh, as something like hidden in a ring or something like that. I don't want everyone from like 300 feet away to be able to unlock my secret shelf. So, also carrying around um, a battery is like really cumbersome. So, like you can imagine like having to make sure your battery is charged to use your credit card would be really frustrating. Um, so let's talk a bit about passive tags. So um, this is also one weird trick if you're going to rob a bank. So this woman here has um, a bag with a lot of money in it uh, that she stole from a bank teller. Uh, maybe she herself is a spy. Who knows? Um, so she gets the money from the teller, um, which is in her purse. And like, let's play to see what happens next. So she, there she is. She's running away. Uh-oh. <laughs> I love watching her run away. <laughs> um, OK, so here's a bit about what actually happened there. Um, so the bank teller has a secret stack of money in case this very situation happens, and it has an RFID in it. Um, when she passes through the doors, which have a reader inside them, that activates another trigger, which is what sets off this die pack, so that the cops can tell that she is the person who stole the money, because she's covered in red dye. Um, our spy here has a lot to learn from us, I think. <laughs> so there are a couple of key components to an RFID system. Uh, there's an antenna and an integrated circuit, uh, which is what stores the bits that are going to be read off by a powered reader. Um, you can embed RFIDs in ID cards, rings, whatever you want, but the material is super important because RFID um, signal can't always go through like metal or something like that, so you can embed them. Um, and then the reader itself has power. Uh, so there are two main requirements. Um, for an RFID system to work. One is forward power transfer. Um, that means like a sufficient power must be transferred into the tag to energize the circuitry inside, which I'll explain what that means, and the radar equation, which is the reader must be able to detect and resolve a small fraction of the energy returned to it. So let's talk about what those two things mean. Okay, forward power transfer. It basically just means that the chip has to actually get energy to transmit data, so they have to be pretty close. You can see um, our badge has like a really wide antenna, and the size and shape of the antenna affects how the bits can travel back um, and how much power the chip itself gets. So our smaller chip, which is embedded in a ring, has to go much closer to the reader. Uh, the other thing is the radar equation. So what this means is that um, the RFID reader itself has to actually be able to tell what bits it's getting. Um, so if you've ever gone up to like a, a reader with your wallet and tapped and haven't been given access, it's probably because this requirement isn't being met. You have two cards that are both trying to transmit data back, and uh, they're conflicting with one another. So if we do it one at a time, it actually works, and we can read it properly. OK, so um, I keep telling you that it's powered, but I don't think that's always immediately clear. Um, so this is a good example to like kind of highlight what that is. That's my finger. Um, I have a NFC chip on my nail that has a light on it. And when it gets close to the reader, it gets powered. Um, and when it goes further away, you can see that the power decreases. Um, this reader also has a constant duty cycle, so it's always trying to scan for cards. Whereas this one, sorry, there's a lot of videos of me in this. It's very <laughs> embarrassing. 
Um, this one has a slower duty cycle, so it's only cycling a few times. Um, so what's actually interesting about this? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> um, if I'm a spy, which I told you it was, um, I'm trying to understand a bit about the environment that I'm in. Um, so let's say I want to get into a building. Um, well, I want to know what frequency the tags are that are used to get into that building. Um, so an NFC chip on my nail, which is high frequency tag, um, if it lights up when I touch the reader, then I know that that frequency is high frequency. If it doesn't light up, then it's low frequency. And then that tells me when I want to snoop on someone's devices, which frequency to set my little snooper to. We'll get to that later, too. Um, OK, so I've been talking a lot about the different kinds of frequencies. Um, it goes from low to high to ultra high. Um, and they range from about 125 kilohertz to 13.5 megahertz, if you want to know that. Um, and they each have like these different properties. So uh, as the frequency increases, it actually gets closer and closer to light, which I think is a good mental model for what's happening here. So um, a higher frequency tag has a harder time uh, going through water. Uh, so if someone has an RFID inside their hand, it's usually a low frequency tag because that's not impacted by water. Um, a low frequency tag has a slower data transfer rate, so that's kind of why it's a lot harder to uh, put two tags up to a reader at once, for instance. Um, and there are a couple other things uh, about these that you can kind of scan. Um, so a low frequency tag is commonly used for um, things like badges into buildings, et cetera. Um, a high frequency tag is used for like a contactless payment system, so like a more sophisticated credit card, you might just be able to tap. Um, or it's used for um, like Apple Pay, things like that, transit systems. We're going to be getting one, so then you can like dissolve your um, new Metro card in acid and or acetone and put it on your fingernails. So look forward to that. Um, I'm really excited about it. <laughs> OK, and then the ultra high frequency is used in something like the die bag, where you want to be able to uh, have a person be able to go through a reader, and it can pick up at like a three meter range or so. OK, so I'm scanning a card. And this is some real output that I took the other day. Um, this is like a scan. I'm going to tell you a bit about what this means. OK, so when the reader gets powered, I said it sends a signal back. And what it does is it switches between low and high states. Um, modulating these values so that the reader can tell, is it a zero, is it a one? What's the key card here? So the lower frequency, or sorry, the uh, low state is zero, the high state is one. You kind of get the idea. OK, so here's some output from a card. Um, let's say I stole this um, from someone by scanning it uh, on the street and then replaying the card uh, at my home. So what do I know about this? Really nothing yet. Um, we know it's like low frequency. We know it's 96 bits, but that's about it. The reader that I have also tells me what the uh, key code is. So what's good about this is this is probably whatever stored on the back end of whoever is like um, associating this system with an individual user. So it's probably this string here of hex that is associated with like an individual user like Goldsam. Um, so. If I convert this to binary, I should be able to find it. Um, I don't. That sucks. <laughs> and it, spent, it took me so long to figure out why I couldn't find this string uh, in that uh, initial binary. So I'm going to give you this for free. You don't have to spend days doing it. Um, and one of the reasons it's so hard to find information about how this is stored is because the people who um, maintain these spec sheets don't necessarily want you to have the information. Um, because they have proprietary hardware um, that they don't want you to be able to read. But they can't stop us, so. <laughs> um, and I found the spec sheet. OK. Yes. <sighs> Thank you. So you can see in this like, really small text, there's a place that says 0 goes to 0, 1, and 1 goes to 1, 0. Great, that took me days. Um, <laughs> so OK, now we will uh, encode our, our binary. And it looks like this. Um, which might be familiar to you, I'm sure. So we have a system, and it works. Like This is definitely part of that original 
the original binary that we read, which is the frequency, which is pretty cool. Um, why do this? Why encode the binary like this just to frustrate me? I don't know. Um, but actually, there is a really good reason for it. For it. Um, so remember how I talked about the radar equation and if you have like two cards at once sending a signal back? So if I'm a reader and I'm getting this like 1111 or something like that, I know automatically that this chip is corrupted. Um, or that I'm getting some kind of weird signal back that isn't actually data that I need to process. So that's like one reason you might do that. Um, and what about those 8 bits at the top? Why weren't they in there? So those 8 bits are something called the preamble. And the preamble is kind of like the version number. Like if you're writing code and you put the version number for your JavaScript library at the top of your file, that's basically what this is here. It says, what version am I and how should I read the rest of the data on this card to the reader? So you have something like an org code, um, the type of product, and a unique identifier. And the org code is something that's uh, given by this consortium called the EPC. And what's interesting about that is if I'm stealing someone's card and I don't know anything about it, but I can get the org code off of it, then I can tell a little bit more about who I'm spying on, which is really exciting. <laughs> and if I do know who they are, then I have this key code um, and I can just have a big like suitcase or something like that with a giant antenna and walk around with it and just steal all your cards and then replay them back and get in wherever I want, which is really cool. I bet I could hide one in my dress. That's what I was thinking. It would be pretty cool. <laughs> you wouldn't know. Um, so that is the first bit of our like spy story. Um, how did we do? I think we did great. Nice. And I'm going to give us a freebie, which is this other wiki how. Um, this is from the same spy wiki how. Don't worry. I'm not sure. Like, a traitor here. Um, and this one is to start eavesdropping, which I think we took care of. Um, so let's see what happens next, according to WikiHow. Um, the next project I'm going to tell you about um, is a piece of stained glass, which tells me if it's going to rain in the next 12 hours. Um, so I know if I should like ride my bike. So this is gather intelligence. Check. Done. Um, and establish a protocol. I don't think that they meant HTTP, but I think it's OK. <laughs> also, this metaphor was wearing really thin at this point, and I, I really needed this, you know? So thanks. Um, OK, so this is a piece of stained glass. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about it. That sort of um, opaque black panel on the previous slide is an LCLV panel. It's a liquid crystal light valve. Uh, it's used in like TVs, or um, a computer might have it. It's also used in a lot of like bathrooms these days, which um, so it'll like turn opaque if it's occupied. And like my first concern is definitely like what happens at a power outage, um, <laughs> obviously. And it can actually maintain some of that um, that state for like a couple of minutes. So like you should be safe, but I really wouldn't trust it. So I don't know. Do with that what you will. Those bathrooms are at your own risk. Um, okay, but we can think of this as sort of like our glass panel as a single pixel on an LCD display uh, that we can then control. So the software we write for it is like writing software for an interface of one pixel. Um, so first we build a simple circuit and connect power to ground, and then it turns opaque, which is very exciting. This is sort of like the hello world of uh, hardware projects. So we want to like actually control that, um, not just be powered all the time. So we insert a microcontroller. Um, uh, to our system, and then we can modulate whether or not it's turned on. So, okay, for this project though, we have to use a Wi Fi enabled microcontroller because we need to understand if it's going to rain. Um, you can also use sensors for this, but I wanted to hook it up to an API. Um, okay, so we need to hit our little baby sky server, the cloud, and sort of we make a request like, hey, is it going to rain in Brooklyn? And the server asks another server, uh, or another API, uh, the Dark Sky API in this case, uh, hey, uh, what's the weather in Brooklyn? It says, here's everything I know about the weather in Brooklyn. And it gives you this huge JSON blob, um, like my latitude and longitude, uh, the hourly precipitation and summary and stuff like that. OK, so on our side, we parse that information. Uh, look at the hourly stats and precipitation probability, and then we can return a single Boolean value. Like, it's going to rain, um, or it's not going to rain. 
Um, and we can do that every like 30 minutes or so. So it kind of pulls every 30 minutes like, hey, what's the weather in Brooklyn? Um, oh, one thing that's important to talk about actually. Um, you may be wondering like, why doesn't this microcontroller just hit the dark sky API itself? Like, why would I put this extra server there? Um, and that's a really, really good question. So these Wi-Fi enabled microcontrollers sometimes have their own sort of language associated with them. Like the electric imp is one and it has its own language called Squirrel, which is kind of like C. Um, and C and C-like languages aren't necessarily notoriously known for their ability to parse uh, JSON, where, <laughs> unsurprisingly, especially where I don't know exactly what the size or shape of what I'm getting back is, so it's just really prone to error. So that's kind of one of the reasons that I uh, went with this system. We want to basically offload as much computation uh, to the server as possible so we can like work with a more contemporary stack. Um, not that I have a problem with C. <laughs> um, okay, so then we put our piece in um, our little like stained glass situation over here, and we solder around the stained glass. And what that means is it's connected to our ground wire over there, um, and then we can just connect our wires to any place where there's solder along this piece of stained glass. Ta-da! Um, and that's, that's about it. Um, this is a video I'm like updating. Sorry for all these videos. Um, I'm updating the API over here manually. And I brought this with me. So if people want to play with this stuff, <laughs> I was really excited. <laughs> I still am just that excited. OK. Um, like I said, I'm, what's up? Yeah. <laughs> OK, ready? Um, like I said, this is just like reliving all of my childhood fantasies. So. Um. <laughs> That's it. Um, okay, so let's check in uh, with Wiki how to see how we did. Um, tech savvy, what do we think? Yeah. yeah. Um, a disguise? I don't know. Okay, I'll give it to us. <laughs> Why not? Um, oh, one of their pieces of advice is to delete yourself from the internet. Obviously, no. <laughs> also, so rude. <laughs> um, get a day job. Uh, also rude, but I do have one, so it's here. <laughs> um, this whole thing is like a personal attack. I don't want. I don't want us to get in shape. No, thank you. <laughs> get out of my life, WikiHow. Um, creative, definitely. I'm gonna give us that. Smart, duh. Um, hide in plain sight. We went over that a lot. Yes. Um, have a backup plan. We don't need it. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Um, another round of applause for Sam. Because why not? <laughs> cool. Okay, we're gonna have a two, count them, two minute break, uh, and then we will return here uh, for Q and A. Okay, everybody, that was two minutes. Um, we're gonna start the Q and A. Uh, two things before we begin. First thing is please check in with yourself and make sure that the thing you're about to say is a question and not a statement in disguise. It is very easy to make statements during a Q and A. If you have any statements, you can make them to Sam later. Okay. Uh, <laughs> or don't. Well, just make sure it's a okay. question. <laughs> um, the other thing is that if you are thinking of a question and you're kind of agonizing over it and you're thinking this isn't a good question, please ask it anyway because it's very likely that somebody else has the same question and that you are overthinking it. Uh, cool. So you will be first. Uh, I'm going to be on this side of the room and then Alicia is going to be on this side of the room. So. Uh, Sam's not going to be calling on people. Just make eye contact with one of us or raise your hand and we will find you and give you a mic and let you know when you're going. Sounds good? Wonderful. Hi, great talk. Um, <laughs> can I join your spy society? Oh my god, yes. <laughs> okay. You're going to be um, the first one to know. <laughs> Seriously. Yes. Okay, real, real talk, the real question. Okay. Um, what is next for you? Ah, great question. <laughs> um, okay, so I think that um, sometimes I just sort of like have materials in my head, and, and I, we, we were talking about this earlier, but I try to make work that like feels like it sort of fits in the natural environment that it, that it lives in. So 
One of the things that I have in my head to work with is um, heat reactive paint, but I don't want it to just be like something like totally like slapped on there. Uh, so I want to like really think about what I can do with heat reactive paint or um, something like a UV um, screen, which has like a laser, perhaps like a plotter uh, with a laser on it. And what I like about that is that the uh, laser sort of slowly fades away in some places. So if you can like work with that timing, that could be really elegant. Um, that's just like some of the things that I'm thinking about. Also, electroluminescent screen printing is really cool. Um, and I made an internet friend who said that he would help me do it. Um, <laughs> I tried to email like all these chemical companies and be like, will you please sell me your special chemicals to do this? And they didn't get back to me. <laughs> so I guess maybe not that, <laughs> but I'll try. <laughs> Thanks. What was the most satisfying thing to learn oh. while working on these projects? Ah, that's such a good question. Um, like the some of the hardware stuff was like really infuriating, um, but I think some of that also then becomes like the most satisfying. Like reading the frequencies and then being like, "That's real. I see that that's connected to the code. Like I figured out this. I like unlocked the secret of like how this is encoded. That was like really special." Um, and like, it also felt to me like it had a bit of historical significance. Like, I went to see um, sort of the first computer at uh, Bletchley Park, and um, basically what happens is sound plays out and gets printed. The frequency gets printed on ticker tape, and then women would sit there and read that ticker tape, high frequency, low frequency, high frequency, low frequency, and type in those bits. And I was like, that's what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> that's me. So that was really cool. I liked that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the talk. It was amazing. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know when you were working on these projects, what was the most challenging thing you came up on? Oh, yeah. Um, I think like every sort of microcontroller that I've used has its own special way. And um, it, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. And then. Also, the reader that I was using has its own special way. So I was digging through a lot of like C, and that was frustrating um, just to figure out, like, OK, how does any of this work? And it was mostly really, really frustrating. I got a lot of like seg faults. And uh, it's kind of painful to sort of pick up uh, each new um, tool's very specific ecosystem, I found. Uh, but one of the cool things I found when I was like digging through the C code for the Proxmark, which is the tool that I used to read, um, is that like obviously all the people who are writing this code like seem like friends? Like I don't know, maybe not, but they would <laughs> write these like little messages to each other, like oh, this is like Sam's super secret decoding method or things like that, which I thought was really cute. <laughs> um, so that was special, <laughs> but also frustrating. <laughs> hey, great job. I would like to know more about active versus passive RFID. Sure. So my question is for EasyPass, mm -hmm. um, you said those were active RFID. Yes. Does that mean they're always sending out their signal looking for the reader? That's a really um, good question. Okay, so what it means is that the, the badge itself, instead of being powered by the reader externally, it has its own like battery system. And so that means it can sort of like boost its signal a lot further. So the RFID itself is actually connected to a battery, whereas like a credit card isn't connected to a battery mm -hmm. and has to get its power from being in the proximity of something with power. Okay. And then that so has a, the, oh yeah, what's up? Sorry, no. Um, then, then the reader, or sorry, the badge with power has its own uh, much larger electromagnetic field that can come into contact with that of the reader. Okay, yeah. so for the, the reader and uh, passive RFID, mm -hmm. is that like an asymmetrical relationship where the readers always have power and so the readers are always yeah, the readers okay. always have power in that okay. case. Mm -hmm. They might not necessarily be sending signal out like every, like continuously, um, but they always have their power. So they might be sending signal out like a couple of times a second or something. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, great question. So in the beginning of the talk, you had this light that was on your fingernail um, oh, yeah. that was showing you some information about the. Cool. The, about the like duty cycle of the RFID reader. Can you talk more about like what that is and how you made that? Yes, okay, um, so you can just buy these and I have some with me um, so that people can play with them. Um, and 
you can just buy them. They're NFC chips. An NFC chip is like the same kind uh, that's a high frequency tag, so like you have in a credit card or something. Um, there's also this tool that you can get uh, from like Dangerous Things that looks like a credit card, and it's basically like a little snooping device to tell like what kind of RFID readers are in range of you, but instead you can just have them on your fingernails, which is way cooler, I think. Um, but you can also um, get chips. This one doesn't actually have like any memory on it, but usually an NFC chip will have some kind of memory, so um, I would just use this to like snoop on things. Um, like what if, okay, I was imagining, like what if I am in like a bank or something, and I'm trying to figure out, I have like someone's key code that I stole, and I'm trying to figure out where the reader is because it's hidden, and then I could just like go like this. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would know, which is pretty cool. So, it's pretty great. <laughs> You're really like going deep inside my mind here. <laughs> it's kind of scary. Uh, <laughs> okay. I have heard over here, um, I've heard that there are anti-spies mm. who try to find out the um, RFID devices that spies have. How oh, do you protect yourself against being <laughs> caught? Um, I'm definitely on lists, like somewhere. <laughs> I buy a lot of weird stuff. Like, I'm emailing chemical companies. Like, it's, <laughs> I'm def I'm like first on the list for sure. I know it. So I just don't worry about it yet <laughs> until it becomes a problem for me. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Sam. I really Hi. loved your talk. Thank you. Um, the part that you talked about with attaching an RFID receiver or something to your suitcase and then dragging mm -hmm. it through, like, and capturing people's oh, yeah. codes, like, could you can go more into that, like, the security totally. aspect of it? I'm yeah. Confused about it. It's a great question. Um, okay, so one like common, like maybe the most common image that you have is like someone with a suitcase. Um, so if you put a really big antenna on it, I'm, I mentioned that the antenna size and shape impacts how far it can read. So if you put a big antenna in a, like a suitcase size antenna, um, and then you have a reader attached to it, um, I can play uh, this Proxmark that I have, which is the tool for reading it. I can basically hit like record on it, so I can take my suitcase or my big swoopy dress, and just walk past someone, press the record button, and then press stop. And I don't even need to do anything with it. I can just replay that frequency on the Proxmark itself. So then I can take my like suitcase, just follow someone into their building, and uh, it's pretty sneaky. Hi. Um, what kinds of things are like easiest to copy? Um, and should people be worried about other people copying their yeah, stuff? Yeah, that's a really good question. Mostly, I'm going to say that you're safe. Like, probably people aren't really doing this all the time. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to guess. <laughs> but also, like, some chips, um, like I mentioned before, that a lot of this is, like, proprietary hardware, so it would be really hard for me to actually scan and demodulate, like, um, the code for, for some RFIDs, and some of them have their own encryption on board, uh, which is pretty cool. So. Um, if, I'm, if I'm faced with a card that has its own encryption on board, I'm not really going to be able to do anything with that data because, um, oh, but the thing you could do is if I actually had the card itself um, and I wanted to put it in something else, you could dip it in an acetone bath and peel back the layers and then take that chip um, and do whatever you want with it. So you can bed that in like a necklace or people put them on their nails to like tap into the oyster system or something like that, like, which is a subway system in London. I am behind the pillar. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. Uh, <laughs> this is related to the previous question. Are there any special protections in credit cards to, keeping, to keep you from like <laughs> replaying yeah. credit cards and spending really all my money? Um, yeah, so I don't know specifically about what's on a credit card, but there are like onboard encryption, uh, which is like a pretty common thing to sort of like protect the card. Um, so it would be really hard for me to like um, do anything with that. And, and also, I mentioned that the memory layout is really specific in a lot of cards. Um, so, so I might not know at all how like the credit card has its memory layout. It probably has like a lot more than ninety six bits, and like might do its own functionality. It just might take a long, longer time to power, or something like that. Um, also, most RFIDs aren't. Um, you can't actually reset them. So, like the RFIDs that I have with me are like read writable, but a lot of them aren't. Like most of your common RFIDs have a single set. Um, key code. Um, some of them are one-time change only, which is really interesting. Stuff like that. 
Hi. Uh, um, here. <laughs> so you mentioned that you know you've emailed chemical companies and oh, acetone yeah. is one of your weapons, I suppose. <laughs> oh. But because chemical companies tend to sell chemicals in large amounts, yes. which presumably you don't need. So yes. I'm just curious, question. I guess, what are the chemicals that you use in your arsenal and how do you convince chemical companies to sell you a small Great amount question. of this? Um, okay, so... <laughs> this is a little embarrassing. Um, okay, so I was like, hi, I'd like some free samples of your chemicals. Like, <laughs> for my business reasons, like TM. <laughs> and perhaps that's why they didn't email me back. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. That's most of what I have to say. But one, there's, um, there's like four materials that you need to do the electroluminescent screen printing. Um, and that's what I was trying to get. They, they sort of sell them as a kit. Um, some like body shops sell them, but they're super, super expensive. And um, I, wasn't, I was trying to get them for free from this chemical company that didn't give them free. <laughs> hey. Um, so uh, you showed like the voltage levels for like the zeros and ones, mm -hmm. um, and I was really curious um, how uh, the devices synchronize so that the scanning windows are the same like slot or whatever. So there's not, I'm not sure if that question makes sense. Okay, um, uh, let me go back to the slide because I, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, <laughs> okay, let's go back. Um, yeah, so okay, um, there's sort of like a a rate at which it sends a signal back. So it's not just going to send it back once. It's going to be like, um, you know, 50 times or something like that, five times maybe. Um, and then uh, once I get like this full width range, like you see how this signal is sent back like many, many times, then I can say like, okay, this is probably low. And so that's a zero. So it's not just like one time I send the signal back. So it's a little bit misleading perhaps. Does that answer your question a bit? Um, so, so like uh, there's like a... Um, because I'm confused about like what happens if like the scanning window isn't synchronized. Like you could get like half of my scanning window says it's zero, and the other half says it's one. How do I parse that as like as like in reader? between here it says it's zero and one? Uh, I guess I just mean like um, like for it to say zero, it needs to yeah, yeah. it would need to say zero for like some amount of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then one That's for true. some amount of time. And then That's zero a really for some good question. Time. I don't have a great answer for that, and I'm not totally aware of how that works. What's interesting is like you can see before. Uh, that read range is accurate. Uh, some of the, the reads are a little bit um, on these lines here, but I, don't, I can't say that like, that's definitely the reason, because I don't know. But it's a really good question. Yeah. Hey, uh, awesome deck. Uh, I wish all presentations uh, thank you. were as good <laughs> as that PowerPoint deck was. Thank you. Uh, my question was, did you play with HID at all? And if so, did you find out how to clone cards? Because I could Yeah, that I have out. them. I, you can do it tonight. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> awesome. That's great. <laughs> Good question. Um, this is the spec for uh, HID. Oh, boop, 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 boop. Let me just go to it. Um, yeah, this is it. So I see it has like the preamble, those eight bits that I mentioned. And then um, do you have... Uh, well, we'll find out. I don't even need to know. But you can do like 44 bits or, or like our cards here are HID 88 bits, and you can do that too. So did you find like writable HID cards? I guess that was the oh. hardest. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> yep. Cool. <laughs> um, I, oh, sorry. Uh, I have a question actually about the part in the slide before this one. Um, okay. When you got to the point of like, okay, so I have this set of zeros and ones and it doesn't match my other set of zeros mm -hmm. and ones. How did you approach unraveling that? Did you like mm -hmm. already know there were specs? What was your mm -hmm. process? I knew that a spec sheet existed for me, but um, I didn't know exactly where. Um, so, so yeah, I, I tried to find that and I tried to find it for like the specific card that I was reading. This one is an HID card. Um, yeah. Uh, they're really weird and hard to find. Like, I spent a lot of time on, like, really strange forums. Like, I got to, like, know the key players. Like, <laughs> there's a guy called Iceman. If he's watching, I feel you. Like, <laughs> I have a connection to him that maybe he doesn't have with me, but, yeah, <laughs> it's special. So I spent a lot of time on forums. 
I'm um, trying to find this. I also like logged into their Freenode channel and was like, what the heck, guys? And um, uh, there was no one there. So. <laughs> but I tried. <laughs> Hello. Sorry. Uh, quick question. So I remember you mentioned RFID rings. Um, are mm -hmm. any of them reprogrammable in the read-write read mm -hmm. sense? Uh, well, yeah. Well. Um, so I got a bunch of tags that are read-writable. Um, so you have to kind of order them specially, um, especially if you want the ones that come in like weird sizes, or like glass capsule RFIDs or something like that, which is the one that I have in my ring right now. Um, oh, and I have them here with me, so you can kind of like play around with them and like scan them, write to them if you want, whatever. Hi, uh, great talk. Um, so my question is, when you were talking about the FRID scanner, um, how do you pick up like the signals? Is it targeted? Like, is it possible for a company to have like a dummy signal being broadcasted and you pick that up? And if you try to like access that, like an alarm goes off. Oh, uh, great question. Okay, so it could be something like. Um, Oh, oh, this is a really interesting thing. So some readers, um, some cards, like, I think have both a high frequency tag and a low frequency tag, and readers can do both. Like the ones in our office, my nails will light up, which tells you that it's high frequency, but I know that our tags are low frequency. So what's going on is it's, it's actually picking up both of those signals at once. So you can have like much more advanced cards that both uh, emit both at the same time. And that's one way that you can deal with like people trying to snoop like me. Yeah, great question. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I was wondering if for passive tags, it the way you've talked about them, it sounds like they have like a fixed piece of data that a reader powers and then reads back. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Does the protocol allow for um, a passive tag to interact at all with something that are, are there tags that like do a handshake or are implement a function such that the reader sends like a blurb and powers it and gets back yeah, some? I think I understand what that. you're saying. I, I think that has to do a bit with like the onboard encryption, and I don't know a ton about that, but basically it'll get like a scan from the reader and then do its own um, sort of work to uh, to figure out um, how to change the signal and, send, and what to send back. But I don't know a ton more about what's actually going on with onboard encryption. But this is a really good question. Hi. Um, you mentioned some of your frustration and the challenges with working with hardware manufacturers and yes. some of the different environments. Did you find any specific manufacturers or classes of microcontrollers that were good to work with like as a hobbyist? Yeah. Um, people tend to be like super nice. Uh, but it's not like Stack Overflow. Uh, like, I can just be like, what's, like, how do I do anything in JavaScript? And, like, someone has already answered, asked my question for me. Um, so a lot of it is just, like, then having to be the person. Like, I didn't want to log on Freenode. And <laughs> it didn't help me, even when I did. <laughs> but, but I think it's, like, a lot of that, like, having to, like, actually go out there and ask people my real questions instead of just having the Internet return it to me. Um, um, and some of it is just figuring out then ways to get those answers myself, like uh, finding a spec sheet that said like, oh, it's zero to one for this other card, so or zero to one goes to one or zero, and then being like, oh, I should apply that to this and see if it works, um, which is incidentally how I program too. So, whatever. <laughs> Hi, Sam. Uh, thanks so much for talking about RFID and giving it a like spy secret agent flavor. That definitely. <laughs> Thank you speaks to me a lot. Um, I was just curious um, how important it is, I guess, with like passive RFID for mm -hmm. there to be a particular like angle of alignment between the reader and the, the key, um, mm -hmm. like for those like coils to be yeah, aligned yeah. and like whether that might make it harder to like snoop off of people's key, like totally keys and cards if they're just like tossed at random angles in a bag. Yeah, the angles are, are really important. So if you try to read uh, your card at like this angle or something, that's going to be really, really difficult. So having it parallel like that is a lot easier. Um, that's another thing I find that it can be kind of frustrating to work with like the, the glass capsule RFID, which has a really tightly coiled antenna. Um, 
is that I still can't figure out which way I'm supposed to point it. Like, it just feels like a huge mystery to me. Um, and it's so small that like the read range, like um, I have my little box here and you can play with it later, but it's, you have to be so close and it like exactly the sweet spot to get it to open, which is kind of frustrating. But yeah, the size and shape definitely impacts that. It's a great question. Thank you, this was so amazing. Wow, I'm <laughs> so loud. Um, so okay, for those of us with HID, entries mm -hmm. to our offices. How realistic is it that we could actually make a... Extremely realistic. I and can make like that what's, <laughs> Can you point us somewhere? Like, what's our timeline? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. So I ordered, um, like, a month. The other thing that's frustrating about this is the time to get packages is so slow. So I ordered a bunch of tags for people to play with here, like, a month ago. And um, they haven't come yet. So, but when, when they do come, you can just go ahead and skin off of your tag and then put it onto anything else, which is what I'll do too. So we can do it together. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Great. This is awesome. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> um, so the ring that you made, mm -hmm. that's a glass capsule. Yeah, that's a glass capsule. So already. did you make the ring, and then what kind of material did yeah, you yeah. use to make it? Oh, great question. Okay, so basically you take a glass capsule RFID, and you can um, put it in like a, a resin ring mold or something like that and just pour resin around it, and it's not going to impact it. So I can just take this off, and you can play with it. Um, so this is kind of how it works. Okay, I'm probably not going to be able to do this right now because, you know, that's like live demos or whatever. <laughs> um, but here, we can try it. Ah! Oh. <laughs> Good! <laughs> there you go. Oh, that was exciting for me, too. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Um, you can play with it if you want. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's okay. Great, wonderful. Oh, Amelia, to your point too, it doesn't have, you don't, you can get the tag off and put it in a different kind of card or RFID. So I can get like um, the tag and then just put the key code on a different RFID type. So. Last two questions. Great. Afterwards, I have stuff that people can play with too, if you want. So asking about this, I guess that's a shelf. Mm -hmm. um, so on the inside, there's a battery. Is that right? Yes. So this is not the sort of thing where you can have a castle that's been abandoned for 500 years and <laughs> things open automatically. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> you have to remember to go in and change the battery when It'll it's beep. still working. It beeps It'll really beep. annoyingly. Okay. So <laughs> it's very annoying. You know when it's time. <laughs> the system talks to me, you know? Hey, Sam. Hi. Um, so if I wanted to reproduce any of these mm -hmm, projects, mm -hmm. where might I look? And is there a wiki how on it? <laughs> hey. <laughs> Great question. Sorry, that was really loud. <laughs> but I was excited. Um, wow. Fabulous question. Um, yeah, so OK, I'm going to try to write up some of this stuff. Um, I have a Proxmark, which is the thing that I used to read it. Um, so that's like a good place to start. But it's really expensive. Um, so I'll bring this around by RC and people can play with it or something if you are at RC. Um, and I'll try to write up a bit about um, the, oh, you did it! <laughs> Yay! I'll try to write up a bit about how the um, glass panel works too. But if you want to use like a, the Photon, that's a good place to start. They have a lot of docs. Some of them are more and less infuriating to read. So your mileage may worry. That's it, I think. Great. Cool. <laughs> Where do I stand? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, that was wonderful. Speaking of live demos, uh, <laughs> Sam has a ton of things yeah. to tinker with and look at. Uh, so we wanted to leave some time for everybody to be able to play with all the cool, fun stuff. Um, thank you all so, so much for joining us tonight. And thank you again to Etsy for hosting us. Wonderful space, and it's very nice to be Thank here. You all for um, <laughs> our next local host talk is on May 15th, and it's going to be at the App Nexus offices in Manhattan. So we hope that you'll be able to join us then. And thanks for coming. <laughs>